In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I've started to wonder lately if it's possible to have too many prophets. I am aware that our collect from last week thanked God for sending God's messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. So I am not anti-prophet, to be sure. I just wonder if maybe we've reached a saturation point. Surely I'm not the only person who feels this way. Doesn't it feel like you can't turn on the TV or click over to Twitter or read the newspaper or even walk down the street without hearing voices prophesying loudly, claiming to know the only path to safety and security and happiness and perfection, claiming to be the only prophet worth following? I guess what I'm lamenting is that there's so much noise of prophecy or what passes for prophecy, going around that it's very hard to have the space to discern what is true prophecy and what is not. Ours is not the first time in which a surplus of prophecy has been the case, by the way. In the prophet Jeremiah's time, as in ours, there were all kinds of prophets running around saying, we have the temple of the Lord, we have God on our side, we have religious freedom, we're the best, nothing can hurt us, so we can do whatever we want. In that time, as in ours, there were prophets running around yelling, peace and safety, peace and safety, which must mean something like, I don't have to wear a mask if I don't want to. It's my God-given right. There were prophets running around saying just what they thought people wanted to hear, in other words. In Jesus' time, the gospel writers say, even he was concerned about certain kinds of prophecy. And if anyone says to you at that time, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. False Christs and false prophets will appear and produce signs and omens, Jesus said. There were plenty of people running around during the first and second centuries, in other words, claiming to have all the answers too. So I guess what I'm lamenting is that we, like many before us, don't have the space to know which is the true prophet prophet to follow. But along comes John the Baptist to the rescue today, because when I read the passage from the gospel this week, I was struck with the very clear sense that John the Baptist is the trustworthy prophet for our time. Here's why I think John is worthy of our trust. John delivers in the reading today a very clear message. In a time of turmoil and upheaval, of grief and expectation, John stands up and says perhaps the most important phrase, I am not the Christ. I am not the Christ. The Christ or the Messiah is the Hebrew version of that same word, just means the one who is anointed. The Christ is God's answer to the deep problems of this world, to the grief and the despair and the hatred and the loss. Christ is the one chosen and anointed by God to come and save the world. And John says, that's not me. That's not my job. John's time, like ours, was an age full of people listening for someone to follow. Someone who would comfort and console. John's audience knew what it was to live with grief and uncertainty, and there was no shortage of leaders who took advantage of that uncertainty to try to push their own agendas, but not John. No, this is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, Nope. Are you the prophet? He answered, Nuh-uh. John begins answering the question about who he is, not by bragging on himself, but by clarifying who he is not. John, as theologian Debbie Thomas says, begins his ministry from a place of humility. 
He doesn't allow his calling to go to his head. He doesn't claim any identity that doesn't belong to him. He makes his listeners no promises of ease and comfort. He simply asks them to prepare themselves for the one who is greater than himself. He stays in his lane. I am not the Christ. If we think we are the Christ, the anointed one, God's own servant to execute righteousness and solve every problem with a divine solution, if we think that, we will act like it. And saints, I'm quite sure that you and I cannot bear that weight. We cannot bear the weight of pretending to be all-knowing, of having every solution to every problem and every answer to the longing of every human heart. We cannot bear the weight of pretending to be all-powerful because deep down we know that we are powerless even to solve all of our own problems, much less those of the whole world. We especially cannot bear the weight of judgment because there is plenty of evidence to suggest that judging the motives of others is a vicious cycle that leaves us feeling more and more empty about our own In other words, if we follow the example of the prophet who begins by saying, I am not the Christ, we are much less likely to go around pretending to be God. But what then is our hope? If you and I are not the Christ, and not able to make the world the way it should be, or the way we think it should be, what do we have to look forward to? What we have to look forward to, simply, is God's grace and mercy. The same grace and mercy that we prayed for when we began today. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us, and because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. If we realize that our hope is not in ourselves, but in God, we actually begin to understand what John the Baptist meant. I am the voice of one crying out, he said, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. John looked at the future and cried out in hope, but not because he was optimistic about his own chances of getting the world the way he thought it should be. It was because John had the humility to hope not in himself, but in God. If you and I can do only that, if hope in God is the one thing we take away from this season of uncertainty and expectation, then we will do well. Because then we will not attempt to change the world by brute force or by the volume of our own prophecy. We will change the world simply by living in it as a community of people who have experienced the freedom of the children of God. We will be a people who exist merely because of the possibility that God's grace will finally save us all. If we believe that, we will know what it means to say, I am not the Christ. We will be relieved of the pressure to always be telling people the way the world should be or the way we think it should be. We will instead live as if the world as God sees it. The heavenly vision of love and peace that God wants is already coming into being. And if we live that way, we will be demonstrating God's irresistible grace. At the same time as we are being relieved of our fallen tendency to force people to see the world exactly as we do. Carly and I finished watching The Crown a few weeks ago and started watching the Canadian broadcasting series Shit's Creek. It finished a six-season run last year. I can't say enough good about it. So instead of raving about the show, I will simply tell you about the documentary following the show's last season. It's called Best Wishes, Warmest Regards. You have to watch the show to find out why it's called that, but it's a documentary about the show. Dan Levy, the show's creator, is talking at one point 
about their vision of creating a show that didn't speak to issues such as homophobia, but rather simply showed a different world where that speech wasn't necessary. When someone who has opposing beliefs, he says, sits down in front of their TV and watches, we're not teaching them a lesson. We're showing them what life could be like. I think we all just need a safe space to learn, learn at the end of the day, he says. I never learn when I feel like I'm being taught a lesson. You see, the people of God are supposed to be like that. We're supposed to let go of the tendency to teach other people a lesson so that they will act like we want them to act. The people of God are instead those who have the particular call of showing people what life could be like by the way we love and live with each other and those around. The priests and the Levites were sent from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? What an opportunity to teach them a lesson, to really let them have it. But instead, John tells them, you're not here to see me. I am not the Christ. I am the voice crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. In the face of many prophetic options, John is the prophet who has figured out what his role is. He has figured out that forcing people to change to fit his view of the world is not only ill-advised, it's impossible. Instead, John is there simply to testify to what the world could be when God comes to live among us, and then he's there to make ready the way. And sure enough, that is the truest prophecy. Because the news of God's coming is the gospel news that brings good tidings to the oppressed, binds up the brokenhearted, and sets the captive free. It builds up ancient ruins and repairs ruined cities. The world doesn't need to be taught a lesson. The world needs to be saved by a God who comes with a mighty hand and a loving embrace who comes to deliver us from everything that keeps us from the love for which we were created. If we really get that, we will be delivered from the tendency to try to do all of that ourselves. We will find the grace to say, I am not the Christ. And then, with John the Baptist, we can go on to cry out with joy again this Advent, prepare the way of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.